a journey to the most ancient chapter in Peru's history, to the most remote civilizations to be born after plants were domesticated by humans. Today, its mysterious remains, having survived the passage of time, are a riddle waiting to be solved. Tombs in impossible spots, sanctuaries that look skyward, the oldest golden ornaments on the continent, and mummies that seem to omit the encrypted secrets of their existence. A country that recovers its past by digging into the earth. The constant struggle of archaeologists to reach burial sites before the Tomb Raiders. A tour of those parts of Peru which remain entirely unknown and unexplored. Our journey begins in the Andes, on the eastern side of the Cordillera Blanca. Here, the highest peaks, like the Huascaran, measure more than 6,000 meters. Between the Huachesca and Mosna rivers, tributaries of the Marañón, at an altitude of 3,185 meters, we come to the Chavín de Huantar archaeological site. It makes up part of the Conchucos Valley and is located in the province of Huari, Department of Ancash. Tucked between the coast and the jungle, this spot was once a point of interaction for various cultures. It was constructed in about 850 BC and was abandoned around 200 BC. For Julio Cesar Tello, who reached the archaeological site in 1919 and is considered the father of Peruvian archaeology, the Chavín culture brought together a variety of Andean peoples. Stone constructions include various ceremonial centers, steps, and partly sunken circular and square plazas, which were built in different eras. The old temple is built in the traditional U-shape of coastal sanctuaries from the formative period. Chavín was a key pilgrimage destination, People traveled here from extremely remote areas to trade their harvest surplus for information about the climate or the possible return of El Nino. There were two social classes, peasants or pilgrims, and specialists who were dedicated to the study of astronomy, farming, metalwork, and construction. In a class above these were the priests, their theocratic government was presided over by a high priest and his clergy, who ruled over the people on the strength of their knowledge. The columns in the Portico of Las Falconidas are engraved with the image of two mythical anthropomorphic birds in the clear style of the rainforest. The iconography draws on animals such as the jaguar, monkey, anaconda, and caiman, which has led experts to conclude that those who settled in Chavín were originally from jungle regions. This temple, known as the castle, was built of white granite and black limestone. At the top of the wall were several inlaid heads, of which only one remains. These were human heads with feline attributes from the Chavín gods. The Raimondi monument shows the Chavín god in the age of the new temple. In the mid-20th century, the learned Italian explorer Antonio Raimondi found the piece in the house of a local peasant. It shows the figure of the so-called God of the Staff, upon whom the universe was thought to turn. Certain aspects of the Chavín were passed down to later cultures, although it is still referred to as the Mother Culture. The Teyu obelisk is a metaphor for the universe. Two lizards, male and female, declare their power over the earth through messengers in the form of a jaguar and an eagle. It was studied by archaeologist Julio Cesar Tello, who gave the piece its name. The most unusual aspect of Chavín de Huantar is its mysterious labyrinth of underground passages. In the niches of the Gallery of Offerings, human remains from various sacrifices were discovered. 
evidence of cannibalistic ceremonies has also been found. They were kept in a constant half-light. After the ritual consumption of hallucinogenic substances, like San Pedro cactus and yopo, pilgrims descended into this underworld petrified with fear. Their pupils dilated. They reached the crypt of the Lanzon, a five-meter monolith with an image of the smiling god, which was naturally lit through a skylight. Sacred musicians played the conch shell, and echo chambers were flooded with water, the sound of which imitated the roar of a jaguar. Thus the subject's fear and obedience grew. Chabin was the theater of the great beyond. Priests initiated pilgrims using a terrifying combination of sets and staging. Our journey continues toward the north, in the mountainous region of Cajamarca. In the province of San Pablo, located on Cerro La Copa, in the Jequitepeque River Valley, at an altitude of 2,300 meters, we come to the ceremonial center of Kuntur Wasi, which was built and rebuilt during the years between 1200 and 250 BC. The sanctuary is made up of terraced platforms, semi-sunken plazas, both circular and square, water canals, and funerary structures. It was built around the same time as Chavín de Huanta. Anthropomorphic monoliths have been discovered with enigmatic feline features related to the coastal Kupisnike style and the Chavín gods. Some of these monoliths show mythical beings holding the heads of those who have been sacrificed. According to the interpretation of archaeologists, the creatures carried the heads to their gods, who in turn assured them of plentiful rain, abundant harvests, health, and fertility. The principal discoveries of Kuntur Wasi were made by Japanese archaeologist Yoshio Onuki from the University of Tokyo. In 1989, he found various funerary elements belonging to the priestly elite. In addition to the famous golden crown of 14 faces, he found necklaces, crowns, ear spools, embossed breastplates, and small trophy heads. The 200 gold pieces recovered from the graves of the Kuntur Wasi priests are the oldest to be found in the Americas. This region has always been known for its high concentration of gold mines. Currently, the Yanacocha strip mine is the largest in South America and the second largest in the world. It is located at an altitude of between 3,400 and 4,120 meters. The gold is extracted through cyanide leach mining. In addition to the drastic transformation of the landscape, locals in the area have complained of contaminated water. Meanwhile, the mines labs, which closely monitor the mines, assure them that there is no contamination. The region of Cajamarca was settled in ancient times. Evidence of this can be found in the petroglyphs discovered on hillsides and in natural shelters. The Yonan petroglyphs are located on the left bank of the Jequitepeque. The oldest rock engravings were made 10,000 years ago. There is no doubt that this hill was always considered sacred, as nearly all ancient Peruvian cultures are represented on its rocks. The 5,000-year-old bones of the so-called Maki Man were discovered near here.
On the 3,500 meter Kumbe Peak, located 20 kilometers south of the city of Cajamarca, we find the stone forest of Los Frailotes. Its name comes from the Spanish word for monk, as the whimsical eroded rocks seem to resemble a group of pious holy men in prayer. In this chaotic landscape, in about 1200 AD, the Cajamarca culture carried out the most significant work of hydraulic engineering in Latin America in the pre-Hispanic era. A nine kilometer canal that stretched from the Pacific side to the Atlantic side. There are numerous caves in this archeological complex. Its walls are engraved with enigmatic petroglyphs. Their meaning is not entirely clear, but they are undoubtedly religious in nature. Some recall the Chavin culture. The canal draws its waters from the glacial runoff of surrounding mountains. Many sections are carved out of living rock. Others are made with sculpted blocks measuring 35 to 50 centimeters wide by 30 to 65 centimeters long, which guide the water in a slight descent that includes tunnels, aqueducts, and zigzag bends that help to slow the speed of the current. The city of Cajamarca has always had an abundant water supply so this colossal piece of work seems unnecessary. For this reason, it's thought that its true function was actually religious. Archaeologist Ignacio Alba explains the mystical meaning of Cumbemayo along the waterway. Recibe el agua del cielo, la canaliza en el sentido horizontal, la reparte homogéneamente en la, a los, hacia los dos lados de la cordillera, y la parte del agua que no puede ser captada penetra a las cavernas subterráneas y sigue discurriendo hacia el inframundo, de tal manera que se unen los tres niveles del cosmos en el punto más alto de toda la región. Cumbemayo representa eso, un paraje sagrado y un centro de culto al agua de primer nivel en toda la región central de los Andes. On both sides of the canal, there are crosses and religious symbols that support the theory that Cumbemayo was an important ceremonial site. Some experts affirm that these flat slabs of rock may have been sacrificial altars. After crossing the stone forest, the canal gently descends through local meadows to the city of Cajamarca. San Antonio de Cajamarca is the most important city in the northern mountains of Peru. Its colonial and Baroque architecture reflect a marked Spanish influence, especially in the cathedral and the churches of San Francisco, Belén, and La Recoleta. The Plaza de Armas in the center of the city features various traces of the past. Here we can see the different phases of its history, pre-Hispanic, colonial, and modern. This is the very plaza where Atahualpa was put to death by Francisco Pizarro, the plaza that witnessed both the beginning and the end of Peru's most ancient cultures. This is the famous Ransom Room, which the Incas filled with gold and silver in order to pay for Atahualpa's freedom. Of course, in the end, he was never released. Seven kilometers from the city, we come to the Incan Baths, natural hot springs. According to historians, Atahualpa was found here when Pizarro's troops arrived. Among the predominant areas in the rugged terrain of the region, we can find an endless array of archaeological remains from the ancient civilization of Cajamarca. One such site 
is the fortress of Coyor, the last bastion of the Cajamarcan resistance during the Incan invasion. A bloody battle took place here, in which the Incan Empire won, allowing the army to continue its march to the north. The fort's central courtyard was probably a temple dedicated to the sun. Around its perimeter are stone steps, aqueducts, walls reaching a height of four meters, and watchtowers. The Cajamarcan culture reached a level of great refinement, as evidenced by the development of its exquisite ceramic work. Potters from Cajamarca worked with kaolinite, which provided a base for the later decoration of ceramic objects. A good example can be found in these tripod bowls. Of clear wadi influence, they tend to be covered in decorative elements, including geometric figures like triangles or circles, and drawings of animals like birds, felines, serpents, and camelids. One of the most amazing peculiarities of the Cajamarca culture is the way in which they had to bury their dead, inside niches carved into cliff walls. These are the so-called windows. Hasta ahora estas tumbas se pensaron de que eran de segundo enterramiento. Es decir, la persona muerta era enterrada en el suelo y con el tiempo a la desaparición de las partes blandas eh, se extraía el cráneo y los huesos largos para ser depositados en estos espacios llamados también ventanas o ventanillas sin embargo recientes excavaciones que hemos realizado en una de estas eh, eh, cavidades o ventanillas encontramos una osamenta intacta lo cual demuestra que estas ventanillas también fueron tumbas de enterramiento directo o de primer enterramiento, como se conoce. El enterramiento presenta este, un prendedor de cobre a la altura del brazo derecho, lo cual demuestra que al momento del de enterramiento de esta persona estuvo con una vestimenta y que este prendedor es para sujetar las prendas que pudo tener en la parte superior del cuerpo. The windows could be either individual or collective, corresponding either to the individuals in a single family or to deceased members of the elite governing class. There was a central corridor with niches on both sides. Burials were also common in which the body was first shrouded and was then deposited inside a clay vessel that served as a coffin. The Cajamarca culture was heavily influenced by the Chavín culture, as supported by the discoveries made in various excavations of objects, including these mortars decorated with deities associated with Chavín de Huantar. The decorative elements on Cajamarcan ceramics frequently include human figures that may represent specific deities. Toward the end of the culture, the ornamentation became extremely elaborate.
The rivers that begin in the huge snow-capped mountains of the Andes descend in a furious rush towards the Pacific coast, sculpting the landscape. Over time, the turbulent waters of the Santa River have carved out the impressive Pato Canyon. Our journey through the formative period continues with the Ventarron excavations near the city of Chiclayo on the northern coast of Peru. In the last decade, archaeological discoveries in Peru have been constant. Some experts have even referred to this country as the Egypt of South America. The Ventarron excavations began in 2007 under the direction of archaeologist Walter Alba who discovered the tomb of the Lord of Sipan in 1987, and Ignacio Alba Meneses, his son. In just a few days' time, they discovered a mud temple from an ancient civilization which had remained unknown until then. Todo el templo fue construido con masas de arcilla, canteada, cortada, de lecho aluvial del río. Estas fueron transportadas y colocadas como si fueran adobes. Estamos entonces ante un templo que precede a la invención del adobe, quizás uno de los templos más antiguos del Perú y quizás el primero al origen de la civilización en este valle. Estamos hablando quizás de 4000 años de antigüedad. This model shows how the original sanctuary may have looked. It was built in various phases, the last of which included a system of wide buttresses for supporting the massive core. This structural belt made the temple appear to be extremely solid and architecturally balanced, a solution that seems to have been inspired by the shapes of the surrounding hills. The first levels of excavation revealed numerous burial sites from more recent cultures, from the Inca to the earliest of the Kupisnike cultures. Esta es otra de las esquinas de la plataforma superior del gran templo. Tiene forma trapezoidal y estos relieves almenados. En esta esquina, en la época posterior, Eh, mucho más adelante, en la época Inca, fueron enterradas tumbas intrusivas. Esta es una tumba, una de estas tumbas intrusivas, o sea, el templo inicial, el templo de la primera época formativa, fue ocupado después por los Incas, considerándolo un lugar sagrado, una huaca de los ancestros. The painted walls that appeared had to be secured. The saltpeter that is blown here by coastal winds quickly takes its toll on the walls. Este proceso es agua destilada. El motivo de aplicar el agua destilada es porque es un agua 100% pura, carente totalmente de sales, minerales, de ácidos, de microorganismos que contribuirían a contaminar las estructuras. On one side of the main area, a mysterious polychrome mural was discovered. Three months later, when it had been completely unearthed, a figure appeared that had remained unknown until that time. On the western slope of Cerro Ventarrón, covered by dense deposits of aeolian sand, groups of various buildings were discovered that had the same technical characteristics as the Temple of Ventarrón. In some sections, large structures were discovered, including multi-leveled terraces, platforms, and flights of stairs. This elaborate and extensive group of structures, the extent of which is still impossible to calculate, seems to have been used for housing purposes, perhaps for elite members of the religious class. Other structures fit the description of minor temples. Efforts to consolidate and clean the Temple of Entarón 
have continued throughout the last few years. About 4,500 years ago, this fertile valley sustained a considerable population. Agriculture developed significantly, especially the cultivation of edible plants and cotton. In the temple's ash deposits, the result of cleaning ceremonial fire pits, the remains of a full range of plants have been found, including squash, pumpkin, sweet potato, egg fruit, avocado, and cotton. The bones of large fish from various marine areas have also been uncovered, as well as marsh birds and mammals like deer and river otters. The main area of the second phase of construction had walls up to three meters high with rounded corners. The exterior facade was painted with wide oblique stripes of white on a red background. Their zigzag pattern would have had a strong visual impact. And finally, a mysterious mural, the most ancient of the Americas, was discovered in the main area. Este es el mural más antiguo de todas las Américas, reconocido así por los principales investigadores del tema. Se trata de un mural polícromo, magníficamente colorido, muy antiguo para las tradiciones culturales del Perú. El mural representa básicamente una gran red, una red de cacería en la cual han sido capturados varios cérvidos, varios venados. Se trata probablemente de un ritual colectivo muy importante en el que se reivindicaban tanto la importancia de las redes en la actividad eh, social y ceremonial, así como la reivindicación del espíritu cazador. Las redes formaron la base productiva de esta primera civilización, Ventarrón, eh, creció y alcanzó tal desarrollo gracias a esta importante actividad productiva. Another notable discovery was the structure built in the shape of a chacana or Incan cross. This was the ceremonial hall and is undoubtedly the oldest ever found to date. Este es el recinto al que hemos denominado la chacana por la forma cuadrangular, por la forma escalonada de la planta. Esta forma, este símbolo de la cruz cuadrada fue muy usual en los Andes eh, prehispánicos. Se trata justamente del de símbolo que representa el eje del cosmos, el punto de unión entre la tierra y el cielo. Es pues al interior de este recinto donde se incineraban ofrendas para pedir la prosperidad, para pedir la lluvia fundamental para iniciar el ciclo agrario. La sala además está decorada al exterior con magníficos murales polícromos con la misma tonalidad de colores que la sala principal. En este mural, las imágenes más bien son geométricas y probablemente los ángulos de sombra conectaban un eh, vértice con otro a través del año, creando así eh, un gran reloj de sol. About one kilometer to the east of the Temple of Ventarrón, there are also excavations. The so-called Coyud Sarpan complex features evidence of the early, middle, and late formative periods. The various levels of earthen plaster appear to be intact. The temple was probably buried voluntarily in anticipation of the arrival of El Nino. This complex was built with cylindrical adobe bricks, the same kind that have been found in the Cajamarca excavations. This design is evidence of the formative contact and exchange between different cultures. Tombs from various cultures have been discovered, from the Kupisnike and the Chavin to more recent cultures like the Inca. The study of bones from these graves could shed light on the ancient inhabitants of the Ventarron Valley in Lambayeque. Estamos descubriendo quizás uno de los templos más importantes y más monumentales del Perú antiguo, de la cultura Kupisnike, de la época formativa. Quizás eh, estamos viendo la fachada de lo que fue un gran eh, monumento, uno de los templos más importantes de esta época, contemporáneo a Chavín. Eh, y acá en la costa, eh, quizás en toda la costa norte, el templo más grande que se haya podido encontrar. A 
Although the sacking of archaeological sites has taken place throughout the country, it is much more intense in coastal areas. Every opening we can see from the air is a pillaged tomb. It looks like a lunar landscape. The Tomb Raiders organize themselves in bands, some larger than others. Every day, they look for new areas where they can dig in search of graves, sanctuaries, or pyramids. The majority of these poor people emigrated from the mountains during the Shining Path terrorist movement. Their living conditions are miserable, and they have no chance of finding work. Their only way out is tomb raiding. In spite of the harsh sentences handed down for this clandestine activity, every day Peru's archaeological treasures are sacked by these bands. The truly guilty parties are those who traffic and deal in archaeological treasures, thus encouraging the sacking. The value of a piece of pottery for which a tomb raider is paid just a few dollars is multiplied by 1,000 on the black market of collectors. Under cover of darkness, hundreds of tomb raiders demolish the remains of ancient Peruvian cultures. Mummies are disrespectfully exhumed and hurled into the open, disrupting their eternal rest. Before beginning to excavate, the Tomb Raiders carry out a small ceremonial offering to Pachamama, the Earth Goddess. They ask her for protection from the Mal de Waka, their name for the superstition they believe in, which brings sickness and disgrace to all those who provoke the spirits of the dead they disinter. The graves end up totally destroyed, and the information they contain about these millinery cultures is forever lost. Little by little, the grave goods of the deceased are revealed on the floor of the pit. Ceramic vessels, textiles, tools, ornaments and adornments, together with a jumble of human bones from the funerary bundles that once shrouded the bodies. Using a mallet, they tap the ground, trying to sound out the pieces that could be buried there. The pits they dig in desert areas can sometimes become deathly traps. The unsupported sandy walls have been known to collapse, burying the Tomb Raiders alive. Our descent continues along the coast until we reach Sechin, located about five kilometers from the city of Kasma in the department of Ancash. This is one of the most important archaeological monuments from the formative period. It was built in about 1600 BC by an unusual culture that was exceptionally knowledgeable about human anatomy. Located on Cerro Laguna, at 90 meters above sea level, this site is known by locals as the Huaca del Indio Bravo. It consists of a mud temple with various outbuildings that are in keeping with the design of other structures from the formative era. The sanctuary is surrounded by a stone wall, which is decorated in bas-relief. We enter through a door that once had a stone lintel and gave way to a flight of steps. The building has the rounded corners so characteristic of this era. More than 300 slabs of sculpted stone decorate these structures.
The engraving was done using abrasion techniques. Each slab of stone, weighing up to 10 tons, features a different motif, which is related to the horrors of war. Warriors with huge maces, or victims with their heads split wide open. A different part of the human body is represented on each of the stone slabs. Arms, legs, heads, chopped up bodies, eyes, vertebrae and entrails, as those strewn about on the ground, recreating an artwork of unspeakable drama and horror. There are no figures of gods, demigods, or mythical animals, only humans. The monument is a detailed testimony, which the ancient inhabitants of the Kasma Valley left here, written in stone. It tells of the bloody struggles they fought for the domination of these fertile valleys, true oases in the desert of the Peruvian coast, some of the most arid and lifeless deserts on Earth. From Sechín, our travels take us to the fortress of Chanquillo and the Temple of Las Andas, some 20 kilometers due south. In a strategic part of the desert, the sacred fortress of Chanquillo rises up, along with the oldest solar observatory in the Americas. Its construction dates to 350 BC. It is made up of three structural units, which occupy a vast area. On the highest part of the hill, we can see a construction with three concentric ovoid walls, with strategically placed entrances and points of access. The last of the walls encloses two buildings with a circular ground plan, and to the south, a group of rectangular rooms. The fort remained intact until 1970, when it was almost completely destroyed by a powerful earthquake. Several thick beams from a carob tree support the wall's weight, ensuring the safety of the tunnels leading to its interior space. This fortress was probably built for two reasons, for controlling the fertile valley at the foot of the hill, and for protecting the learned men who lived and studied astronomy here. Behind the fortress, on the crest of a low ridge, 13 towers make up the solar observatory. In March of 2007, the prestigious magazine Science published a revealing report which was immediately echoed by the news agencies of the world. The oldest solar observatory in the Americas, discovered in northern Peru. The scholars who lived in Chanquillo observed the rising and setting of the sun throughout the year. According to archaeologist Ivan Getzi, the sanctuary and fortress of Chanquillo would become a central pilgrimage site in its day, just as Chavín de Huantar had been. The northern coast of Peru is one of the most arid parts of the world. This strip of desert is no more than 100 kilometers wide, extending from the Andes to the Pacific Ocean. Despite being barren, this territory was the birthplace of the oldest cultures and civilizations in the Americas. Near the fortress of Chanquillo are the remains of the Temple of Las Aldas. Considering it was built 5,000 years ago, its scale is breathtaking. The most important structure here consists of three sections, one in the center and two to the sides, which are made up of stepped platforms that lead from the south to the northeast, up to the top of the hill. Judging by the sheer size of this sanctuary, we are logically led to believe that the number of inhabitants along these coasts in the archaic formative era was quite high. There is a notable lack of fresh water here. The closest possible supply of drinking water is 20 kilometers away. 
How could they have transported it here in a pre-ceramic age, when there were still no containers or vessels? Now let's head to Caral, in the Supe Valley, about 200 kilometers north of Lima. Nearly 30 spots similar to Caral have been registered in the same valley. But until now, only Caral has been excavated. From the same era as Las Aldas and Ventarrón, between 4,000 and 5,000 years ago, Caral was built on the left bank of the Supe River on a large expanse of flat land, about 350 meters above sea level. It occupies an area of about 65 hectares, where there are seven large pyramids surrounded by other smaller pyramids for a total of 32 structures. Based on the complexity of these buildings, this was clearly a very advanced civilization. Caral is different from other Peruvian civilizations. The magnitude and monumentality of this city, with vast spaces between its structures, is unique in Peru. There are two pyramids, the main pyramid and the so-called amphitheater. Each has a circular plaza of enormous dimensions, leading experts to believe that huge ceremonies were held here. Despite the excavation work that has gone on here for many years, very little is known about this ancient civilization. Until now, no funerary evidence has been discovered that might shed some light on the habits and customs of local inhabitants. Most theories about Caral draw heavily on speculation. How strange that not a single necropolis has been found here. Some scholars point to the possibility that the deceased were buried at sea, while others think the dead were deposited on sacred hills where they were devoured by wild animals and returned to nature. Some have even spoken of cannibalism. But fire may be the most accurate theory. In the main pyramid, there is a large altar where incinerations took place. Archaeologists in Caral have found several of these altars, located not only in the most important pyramids, but in smaller buildings. Is it possible that the dead were cremated? We still do not have a solid answer to this question. Caral continues to guard its secrets closely. Our journey through the formative era ends with our descent along the coast to Nazca in the department of Ica, some 450 kilometers south of Lima. Etched in the soil of the Pampa del Ingenio since the third century BC, the Nazca lines remain an unsolved mystery. How did the Nazca people make these drawings on the ground and for whom? They can only be seen from the air. Here, speculation stretches to the most surreal limits, from those who maintain they were made by extraterrestrials to those who insist the Nazca could fly. The Department of Ica is home to numerous unsolved enigmas. Before the Nazca people, the Paracas culture reached its height between the 7th and 2nd centuries BC. One peculiarity of the Paracas people was the technique they used to deform their heads. The technique served to distinguish social classes. Several small boards were placed on the head of each child, and the weight slowly changed the shape of their heads. They were also experts in the technique of trephination. In battle, fractured skulls were common, caused by blows from combat truncheons, the most popular weapon of the day. To set the bone and relieve the patient of his pain, rudimentary trephination was practiced. Surprisingly, more than 60% of these procedures were successful. 
Here, we can see how the bone continued to grow after the operation. The Paracas people are famous for their funerary textiles. They wrapped their mummies in elaborately worked mantles that made up mortuary bundles. Later, they were placed in pantheons that consisted of large barrel-shaped shafts. It is believed that these mausoleums were the property of each family or clan. Paracas mantles are quite well known for their beauty and technical handiwork. Today, the industry of traditional textile work continues to be very important in Peru. In many regions, age-old weaving techniques are still in use, nearly unaltered by time. This is also the case with the dyeing of wool, which comes from the llamas, alpacas, and vicuñas. These textiles were a symbol of power for the Paracas people. Governing officials owned a large number of them and were buried with them at the time of their death. The textiles were also used as ceremonial offerings. In addition to weavers, there were people who specialized in the care of wool-producing animals. Others worked with an endless number of plants and insects, extracting their natural colors to make dye. Ceramic work was quite refined. It featured deities and activities from daily life. In certain objects, we can see the representation of the hallucinogenic San Pedro cactus in the shape of a star. Our journey ends with a return visit to the Nazca Lines. There are not only lines, there are also drawings. German mathematician Maria Reiche dedicated 40 years of her life to the study of these lines and drawings. Indeed, many of them coincide with solstices, both lunar and solar. But according to Reiche, these planes were engraved in the first millennium of the Christian era by the Paracas and Nazca peoples. In her studies, she makes the following observation. How and why were they created by a supposedly primitive culture that could not fly? They could only have planned and drawn them on a small scale. But how they could have then carried out the actual engraving in situ and oriented them correctly is a mystery that will require many more years to solve. We have before us one of the most important fields of study in our history, which will lead us to an understanding of ancient man and his way of thinking. Of everything we have witnessed on our journey through the formative period in Peru, these lines and drawings are perhaps the most difficult mystery to unravel. Peru is clearly the most enigmatic country in South America. Its past includes an endless list of questions which for the moment remain unanswered. But discoveries continue to be made. <laughs>